Deep in Northern California, the Yahi, a people 400 strong, stood for thousands of years. Mothers cooked and cleaned, fathers hunted and fished, elders passed on what they had learned, children watched and listened. Families lived together, loved together, to survive. The tribe could stand the test of time, but not an encounter with the new American West. Gold brought the whites. Whites brought farms and deforestation. Deforestation brought famine to the Yahi. The tribe was forced to raid white farmers' lands to survive. The raids brought white hatred, and the white Indian hunters brought guns. The hunters killed off the tribe without taking a moment to see a Yahi spark a fire using only his simple drill tool, or take down a buck with a single swift shot from his cedar bow, or laugh and sing into the night in his family house. For the Yahi, extinction was only a matter of time. 400, 200, 100, 50, 25, 12. By 1872, there were six. By 1911, there was one. August 29, 1911. A Berkeley anthropologist named Thomas Waterman arrived at the jailhouse in Oroville, California. He was sent by the university's famed head of anthropology, Alfred Krober. Waterman came to Oroville in response to reports of a wild man who had recently wandered into town. Waterman used a dialect from a local Native American tribe to try to converse with the man. The Native man's language was related to this tongue, so the anthropologist was able to have a simple conversation with him. Alfred Krober later wrote the account the Native American had told Waterman. His people were all dead, the Native American said. One day he made up his mind to come in. He expected to be killed, but that no longer mattered. So he walked westward all day, and at dusk came to a house where meat was hung up. Tired, hungry, and thirsty, he sat down. Soon a boy came out, saw him, and called a man who came up. They gave him a pair of overalls and drove him into town where he was put into a large and fine house, the jail, and very kindly treated and well fed by a big chief, the deputy sheriff. This was the last Yahi alive, but the first Yahi to encounter the scientific establishment. The Bureau of Indian Affairs gave the man two options, to go back into the woodlands or to live on a reservation. To both of these options, the man shook his head. I will live like the white people from now on. The man said, I want to stay where I am. I will grow old here and die in this house. So the man traveled to San Francisco to stay with Waterman and Krober in Berkeley's Museum of Anthropology and live under the medical care of Dr. Saxon T. Pope. When the man arrived at the museum, reporters swarmed to see the wild man. Their first inquiry was for his name. The man refused, for tribal customs forbade giving one's own name. For the sake of convenience, the Native American was called by his native word for man, Ishi. Ishi spent four years exploring white California. He learned of the white man's lifestyle, and he exchanged with the world what it meant to be Yahi. One of Ishi's most ardent students was Professor Thomas Waterman. Aided by Ishi, Waterman actually made fire with Ishi's fire drill. Enthusiastically, Waterman announced to his class that a passing grade would be granted only to those who could successfully make fire in the same fashion. He then tried to demonstrate the technique to his students, but without Ishii's help, all Waterman could conjure was a thin wisp of smoke. Ishii spent much of his free time with Saxon T. Pope, his doctor from the adjacent hospital. Pope wrote, Many hours were spent in making bows and arrows, in target practice, and in hunting trips in the fields and woods. Pope watched and kept records while Ishii crafted his bows out of wood and sinew. Pope taught Ishii to shoot with the English-style bow, while Ishii taught Pope how to shoot using the Yahi bow. From this exchange grew a friendship that would follow Ishii, even to his deathbed. In the summer of 1914, Krober, Waterman, and Pope were restless. They wanted to go on a camping trip and explore the heart of Yahi territory and learn from Ishii about his native soil. 
while memories of the pain and death that took place in his homeland may very well have been embedded in Ishii's mind. He complied. Ishii set out on horseback with Krober Waterman Pope and Pope's 11-year-old son. During their trip, the group learned from Ishii the art of the bow and spear. Ishii informed the scientists about the geography of his homeland. He told stories and sang songs from his tribe. Over the course of this trip, he taught his companions more about the Yahi than any description ever could. That summer, they lived as Yahi. During Ishii's time in San Francisco, Alfred Krober saw to it that scientists from numerous fields worked with Ishii to learn everything they could about him and the Yahi. From his tribe's songs and stories, to its language and customs, to its territory and history. Krober's supervision ensured that documents that detailed the exchanged information were preserved for the world. In 1961, nearly 50 years later, Krober's wife Theodora would use these resources to write the most comprehensive portrait of the Yahi ever created. The book entitled Ishii in Two Worlds would sell over a million copies. In the spring of 1915, Ishii became ill with tuberculosis. In October, Ishii had not recovered. The museum staff cleared the exhibits in the sunniest room in the house so that Ishii could pass his days there. His health suddenly began to fail, wrote Saxon T. Pope in Ishii's medical history. Some days, he summoned enough strength to talk of his life in the wilds or discuss hunting, folklore, and kindred subjects. In a letter, Alfred Krober wrote, all they could dope up was the usual prescriptions for a typical American case without money. And so Ishii failed to improve. His fever increased and his weakness consumed him. Pope wrote, One night, I was called to his side. He was very weak and faint. He died soon after, at 12.20 p.m., March 25, 1916. His body was taken to the funeral parlor. I visited the parlor and placed in his coffin his bow, a quiver full of arrows, Ten pieces of Indian money, dried venison, and acorn meal. Back in 1911, when Ishii first encountered the anthropologists, newspapers reported that Alfred Krober and Thomas Waterman took pressing interest in Ishii, for when he died, so would his tribal language, culture, and lifestyle. History would prove that prediction wrong. In choosing to explore white America, the same white America that would bring Ishii to his deathbed with tuberculosis, Ishii offered the world a cultural exchange that would bring the Yahi immortality. Immortality through scientific papers, through articles, through journals, books, and motion pictures. Here now is one of the many pieces of Ishii's culture that has been exchanged with modern America, the story of the marriage. Once there was a very beautiful girl. A boy came around every so often and brought her food, for he loved her dearly and he wanted her to love him as well. One day, the girl simply could not hold in her annoyance with him. I do not love you, she screamed. When the girl's mother heard of this, she scolded her daughter. This is a fine young man and a fitting husband. The girl thought about what her mother had said. The next day, she went back to the boy. Marry me, she said. The boy gladly agreed and many, many people came to the wedding. From then on, the boy and his new family decided they would share with each other. The boy would hunt for the family, and his mother-in-law would make acorn meal for him. They would give each other all that they could, and they would forever rejoice in doing so. Years passed. One night, the boy, now a man, lay in a prairie with his wife, looking up at the clouds above. The woman turned to look at her husband. We will grow old together, she said quietly to her lover. But I wonder. Shall it be you who will outlive me, or shall I live on past your time? Who shall go on? You or I?